Hello everyone, Golden Nova here. Today, we're going over Spriggans, and you know what that means, more lore. And personally, I couldn't be happier, because the feedback I got from the Dogmatica and Tribrigade lore video was incredibly positive. If you haven't seen it yet and you're interested in the lore aspect of the cards, I'd highly recommend giving it a watch first, because we're going to be discussing how the latest releases build on my interpretation of the story later in the video. And while I still hold that the new inclusions don't radically change what we know, after taking a closer look at the card art, I discovered a little something extra that got me worried about where the story goes from here. It's time to spring into action with Spriggans. But before we continue, a quick reminder to please like and subscribe if you've enjoyed my content so far. 1500 subs is my end of year goal, and you can help make it happen. We also have a Discord where we post photos of the goodest doggos, and you can also follow me on Twitter if you want to stay in the know on channel updates and my bad takes. Thank you for your patience, and now, back to the video. So what's the deal with Spriggans? Well, the gun part is certainly evident from their design, but if the word feels familiar to you, it may be because you picked it up from a fantasy tale somewhere, maybe a book or a game. Spriggans, or as I learned how to pronounce them in research, Spriggins, are fairies of Cornish folklore who are depicted as wizened old men with childlike heads, so just roll that image around in your head for a bit, who are notorious for pulling pranks and bringing misfortune upon those that wrong them. Another interesting characteristic is that they're small in size, but are purportedly the ghosts of giants, and as such, retain their titanic strength, as well as being able to assume their size. Now, granted, this is all information I scanned from Wikipedia, so I haven't been able to do a deep dive on the legends, so if any of this interests you, I highly recommend looking into it more yourself. Mechanically, all the Spriggans, or should I call them Spriggets to keep with the proper pronunciation, Spriggens? I'll use the Yu-Gi-Oh! organization translations for now, but if you liked any of those suggestions, uh, let me know. Anyway, all Spriggans are fire attribute machine monsters, and if they're the main deck ones, they all share an effect where, if they're in the hand, face up on the field, or in the grave, they can attach themselves to a Spriggan Xyz monster you control. And because everything in the theme revolves around the Xyz monster, we're going to start with them so we have some context for the rest of them. Spriggan Ship X Blower is a rank 8 with 1600 attack and 2500 defense, requiring two or more level 8 monsters, and they have just the most gamer effect I've ever seen. Once per turn, you can choose a monster or spell trap zone on your opponent's field. On resolution, you can detach any number of material from X Blower, and if you do, you can destroy your opponent's cards in the selected zone, as well as cards in the zones to its sides, as well as above and below it, up to the number of material detached. It certainly isn't the most eloquently worded effect text, but to simplify, you essentially draw a crosshair on one of your opponent's zones, creating a sort of area of effect that you can choose to destroy cards from. And much like AoE effects, while you choose a zone, the effect doesn't target any monsters. And that's not all it can do. Its second effect is a quick effect that can be activated specifically during your opponent's main and battle phase, and when you do, Explorer is banished until the end of the turn. This makes for an extremely slippery boss monster, as it's difficult to permanently remove with anything aside from hard negation. So you can demolish your opponent's field, dive beneath the sands during your opponent's turn to avoid counterplay, and when they surface, the Spriggans in your grave can attach themselves to man the battle stations and do it all over again. It's the kind of effect that really puts the wind in your sails. We should also go over the field spell real quick as well. Vast Desert Gold Golgonda gives all Spriggan Xyz monsters a thousand attack, bumping Explorer up to 2600 attack. If you don't control a Spriggan Xyz, you can discard any Spriggan card to summon one right out of your extra deck. Talk about fuel efficiency. Also, if an Xyz monster or monsters you control leave the field due to a card effect, you can target an opponent's monster and it can't attack for the rest of the turn, which pairs nicely with Explorer's self-banish effect, so you don't leave yourself completely open to direct attacks. It's easily a 3 of, because you're going to want to see it as quickly as possible. A rush to the gold, one might say. Okay, let's take a peek at the main deck monsters. Rocky is a level 4 with 1800 attack and 800 defense. If they're normal or special summoned, you can target any Spriggan monster or Vast Desert Gold Golgonda in your grave and add it to your hand. Not really a combo starter, but it does facilitate your other cards in a number of ways. It can recover destroyed Golgonda so you can make the most out of your X Blower, or use it to summon a new one if the previous one was destroyed. You can also add back a Spriggan to use as the cost for Golgonda, and its attack stat is pretty solid for a normal summon. Rocket solid? Petty is a level 4 with 0 attack and 2000 defense, and you contribute them to target and special summon any Spriggan monster in your grave. This is actually vitally important, as our next two monsters are level 8, so having an easy way to access them is paramount. 
And since you can attach the big ones to Explorer from your hand as material, getting them into the grave isn't too hard. They also have a bit of a Seer Dante loop going on with Rocky. See, you summon Rocky, get back Petty, and then you can summon Petty once Rocky's left the field, and then tribute them to summon Rocky back. Then you use Rocky's on summon effect to get back Petty. And when you have a machine monster with those stats, that means machine duplication. You can only use Petty's effect once per turn, sure, but the remaining copies can be used to make a rank 4 or a link 2. You're already going in big on machine exceeds monsters that look like ships, what's an extra Dreadnought Dreadnoid gonna hurt? It's certainly a great way to get your sea legs out in the desert. Bangar is a level 8 with 500 attack and 2500 defense. Hey, another machine dupe target. You can banish them from the grave, along with another Spriggan monster in your grave, to add any Spriggan card from your deck to your hand. And since Explorers that are summoned by your field spell can't be revived, it's not a huge loss if you scrap them for a search. This is a very important effect for getting you the cards you need to move things along, and if you can't manage to get it in the grave by making it an Xyz material, you can always try to tech in something like a Traden. Rocky does recycle after all. But what I'm most excited for, like I said earlier, is machine dupe synergies. Not only will this help make Explorer properly so it can be revived, there are so many superb rank 8s we can use. Number 38 Hope Harbinger Super Duper King Size Double Dip Deluxe Dragon Titanic Galaxy gives you a spell negate, which is fantastic, and we also have Dingirsu for some must answer spot removal. Or, since Bangar introduces Banishing to the mix, attach a Banished Spriggan to recycle your resources, as well as provide even more protection for your board. I'm telling you, this Spriggan's a real banger. Our last on-theme monster is Captain Sargus, a Spriggan that puts in work whether they're on the field or tucked under Explorer. They're a level 8 with 1500 attack and 2800 defense, and as a quick effect during your opponent's turn, you can detach a material from a monster you control to target a face-up card your opponent controls and destroy it. So if your Explorer has any leftover materials on it after using its own effect, Sargus effectively lets you use it as an interaction on your opponent's turn before it begins its evasive maneuvers. And with 2800 defense, they'll stand up to all but the hardiest attacks from your opponent. Also, if they're attached to a Spriggan Xyz monster as material, it grants them an effect that boosts their attack by 500. While you can only attach Sargus to Explorer once per turn, this effect does stack, so you can effectively punish your opponent for not answering your boss monster by continuing to pump up its attack. They're just the kind of captain you need to crunch your opponent. Alright, time for the spells and traps. Spriggan's Watch is a normal spell that searches Vast Desert Gold Golgonda when it resolves, or if you already control one, you can instead add any Spriggan's monster from your deck to your hand and Foolish one from your deck, and that is outstanding. Golgonda is very important to how you play, and Watch counts as copies 5 to 7, assuming you're running terraforming. And unlike other searchers, it doesn't lose effectiveness if you draw it alongside your search target, because then it acts as a rota for the theme that also sets you up for more Xyz material from the grave or for the search effect of Bangar. Your opponent's gonna have to watch out for this one. Spriggan's Blast is a normal trap that can be activated if you control a Spriggan's monster, and it has you choosing a monster zone your opponent controls, and you can select another zone if you control a fusion monster that lists Fallen of Albaz as material. Wouldn't be a lore archetype if it didn't include our little dragon boy. On resolution, until the end of the turn, monsters in the selected zones cannot attack directly, and their effects are negated. And if the zone is empty, it just can't be used. Now, it does seem a little suspect to get the full power of this effect online, adding the Albaz engine hasn't exactly seen much competitive success as of late, but by itself it's still an on-theme effect negation that, much like Explorer, doesn't target, which I'm sure will lead to some explosive outcomes. Spriggan's Call is another normal trap, which you can use to special summon any Spriggan's monster or Fallen of Albaz from your grave. Also, during either player's turn, except the turn it was sent to the grave, you can banish Call and a fusion monster in your grave, then target a Spriggan's Xyz monster you control, and then attach any fusion monster from your extra deck to it as material, so long as it includes Fallen of Albaz as its fusion material. Once again, the second effect is just there to add a bit of extra spice, especially if you're looking to splash in Dogmatica, as attaching the fusions as Xyz material from the extra deck directly is a great way to shortcut for their grave effects without locking you out of that extra deck. But even without that, a Revival Trap takes some of the pressure off of Petty to summon back your monsters, and along with Dogmatica and Counter, Albaz is on call to scoop up your opponent's monsters when you need them most. In fact, let's round things out by going over their new fusion. Splend the Steel Express Dragon is a level 8 Dark Machine fusion monster that requires one Fallen of Albaz and an effect monster that was special summoned this turn. 
A very interesting fusion material that's almost impossible to trigger unless you use one of the aforementioned revival traps, but at the same time, does mean that it can scoop up just about anything your opponent controls. During your main phase, you can move Splin to a different main monster zone on your field, then you can destroy all other face-up cards in its column. Free non-targeting destruction? Sign me up! It also has the effect that all Albaz fusions share. During the end phase they're sent to the grave, you can add to your hand or special summon from your deck a monster of their associated archetype, Spriggans in this case, or a Fallen of Albaz. Now, while I still think Titanic clad the Bastard Dragon is more powerful and useful, once again as competitive lists have shown, Splend comes in a decent second. It does require more work and setup to be used effectively, but solid stats, a primo removal effect, and the ability to fuse using your opponent's monsters on their turn sounds like an express ticket to victory to me. So we've gone over all the Spriggans, what do we do with them? Well, they have a very simple game plan. You make X-Blower, you get materials on it, and you start blasting. It seems like they'll work best when paired with another archetype that needs their bombastic bombardment, but to be honest, I'm not sure what. We don't really have a lot of cards that work super well with Fire Machines. Dark Machines, yes. Earth Machines, certainly. But not Fire. So instead of going into what cards you can play with Spriggans, let's jump right into the lore. Last we left off... Albaz, Ecclesia, and the Tribrigades had just narrowly escaped their clash with the Dogmatica Orthodoxy, the future of our team a complete mystery. Act 3 begins some time later, following the exploits of the Fallen Dragon and the former Saint. We don't know why they parted ways with the Tribrigade, but I'd hazard a guess and say that they were needed on another battlefield. Albaz and Ecclesia are currently navigating a rocky outcrop when someone, likely a Spriggan if the name Spriggan Watch is to be believed, catches a glimpse of them. Now previously, I'd thought it was rocky because their silhouette is in the corner, but it seems weird a visual layout would highlight the one using it. But then I took a look at some of the colors being used in that display. Albaz and Ecclesia have a red box around them, while the little bird that Shrike, or I guess their name is Shrike now, gave them at the end of the last part of the story, has a green box around them, which matches the color of the rocky silhouette. Now, here's where we have to start looking at outside clues. In the concept art for Rocky, we're told that the forms that we see the Spriggans in aren't actually what they look like. They're all mechanical suits of armor that they possess, and they're actually small, spirited away style soot sprites. Not only does this connect them with the Spriggan folklore that they're small but wield great power, it also helps to explain why they're missiles. If they can survive the explosion of their outer casing, they can always return to base for a new one, or perhaps salvage a new body from the desert. So I posit that the tiny mechanical bird that Shrike gave to Albaz was possessed by a Spriggan the whole time. Which would mean, in the artwork for Oath, Shrike is likely telling Albaz to cross the vast desert of Gold Golgonda to meet up with some allies. But that plan may have backfired, as the artwork for Spriggan's Blast shows the group being accosted by what looks like X-Blower. If you see one of your companions traveling with one of the most prominent figures of the church that's oppressing your entire world, it can seem like they've been taken hostage. And without an entourage of Dogmatica soldiers to protect them, now is the perfect time to strike. The little bird being a Spriggan also helps to explain a few things about Splend, the new fusion. Previously, we drew parallels between Titanoclad and Stigmavor, now being called Brigrand the Glory Dragon. Both had glowing red spikes coming out of their body, namely their shoulders, as well as wings with some kind of magma-like quality to them. But Splend lacks all of that, so the conclusion I've come to is that, since the situation isn't quite as dire as the ones that preceded the first two transformations, Albaz is in more control of their power, so this version isn't quite as berserk. So, Albaz temporarily absorbs the power of the Spriggan traveling with them, and uses its power of possession on technology to activate an abandoned ship out in the wastes. The wide shot of Golgonda shows a number of ruins dotting the dunes, so I'm confident there's at least one ship they can make use of out there. There's also the possibility that Albaz is empowering the tiny bird mech to become Splend, and it would be a fusion of them in that sense. In fact, it was recently pointed out to me by user Roman Williams that the shadow form Albaz seems to be in during Nader's Servant does bear a slight resemblance to some kind of ship, so I would also agree that that is a valid conclusion. Our heroes beat a quick retreat, bobbing and weaving through missile fire, until they happen upon a familiar, terrible sight that I only noticed upon repeat viewing of the art. 
the dreaded hole that we saw Hashashian summon, and the same one Albaz fell through, has arrived again. This trips our team up just enough for their pursuers to catch up, and our protagonists are captured. However, this doesn't last long. While they're being interrogated, Kit of the Tri Brigades arrives and clears up the whole mess. They have their own mechanical bird, and between the two of them, they're able to clear things up. This card is Tri Brigade Rendezvous, so based on the name, I suppose Kit is who Albaz and Ecclesia were meant to find. It's a quick play spell that boosts the attack of any number of targeted linked Tri-types by 700 for the turn. Also, if any number of linked Tri-types would be destroyed, you can banish Rendezvous from the grave instead. This also leads us to introducing Tri-Brigade Kit, a level 2 fire attribute beast monster with 700 attack and 1000 defense. They have the same graveyard link effect as their main deck predecessors, and if they're sent to the grave, you can send any Tri-Brigade card from your deck to the grave. Now, this seems pretty lackluster at face value, but it slots in pretty well with an existing combo. Instead of discarding Fractal to send Nerval from deck to grave to search for Karis, you can discard Fractal to send Kit, who sends Nerval to search Karis. And with the simple addition of one more Tri-type being sent to the grave, it gives you easier access to your higher linked Tri-Brigades. It's surprisingly incredibly good. And in keeping with what we found last video, they have a blue ribbon and a weapon with a blue power source, though this one is just a wrench. I assumed the blue energy was some kind of projectile, so unless the wrench can shoot energy blasts, it's likely something else. Also, some more concept art information. Kit is confirmed to be Farragut's little sister, and the cloak Ecclesia is now wearing was gifted to her from Farragut. Kit is also stated as being something of a technology otaku, and they're seen geeking out over an artifact from Golgonda, which looks like a cell phone, so we may have another post-apocalypse story on our hands. With the current dilemma under control, the group focuses their attention on the next looming threat, but it appears the Spriggans don't know how to deal with the giant hole in space-time. The last we see of our cast members is Kit excitedly dragging Albaz and Ecclesia somewhere, and looking at their expressions, they seem just as confused as we are. And as the curtain closes on the third act, we pan out to the vast desert of Gold Golgonda, where it appears Explorer has engaged in combat with another frigate of the Wastes. We don't get a definitive answer of who they're fighting, but considering who we know is responsible for the holes, and that the enemy ship's color scheme shares the same blues, whites, and golds found in Theo's design, we may see them take a more active role in the climax of this year's series of stories. There's also a bit of a post credit sequence. Dogmatica Genesis is a normal trap that has you targeting a banished fusion, synchro, exceeds, or link monster, and another effect monster your opponent controls that matches its card type. On resolution, you return the banished monster to the extra deck, and if you do, your opponent's monster's effect is negated while it's on the field. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of this card. Using it in archetype implies that you've already resolved Nexus, and that an appropriate target fits what you banished for it. Otherwise, it'll only really be useful in corner cases. What I'm most concerned about is the ceremony being depicted. It appears that a new saint is being anointed in place of Ecclesia, and since I can't make out a stigmata, Maximus may be in the process of bestowing one. We don't have any cards specifically for this character, so we don't have any real details, but something I've latched onto is the close-up of Maximus, namely, their hands. In the previous video, I brought up the strange diamond-like markings on their palms, and wondered if it was gloves or tattooed onto their skin. But now, getting a closer look, it seems that the markings are in fact a part of Maximus, and now that we're approaching the final act of this segment of the story, I'm curious to see if the mask will come off and we'll see the face of the Church of Dogmatica, as well as what it could mean for the world at large. The next core set, Lightning Overdrive, drops in the OCG on January 16th, 2021, so in a little less than two months, we should have our answers. For better, or for worse. But now, I want to hear what you all think. What decks are you excited to see splashed with Spriggans, or are you going to try and run them all by themselves? And what do you think is in store for Albaz and Ecclesia? Let me know in the comments, and if you haven't already, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you want to help me out even more, share this video around. If you stayed until now, I'm pretty sure you enjoyed it, and I'm sure someone you know will too. Thank you all so very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye